we are live a very good evening everyone welcome to i focus online episode 315 back to basics uh, module uh, episode 5 we have with us dr ravi verma sir from city neuro center hyderabad talking to us on essentials of mri for an ophthalmologist sir has done his dmrd from kasturba medical college manipal uh, went on to do his dnb radiology and dm neuro radiology from trivandrum currently he is a senior consultant neurologist at city neuro center hyderabad his area of expertise includes uh, pediatric neuroimaging advanced neuroimaging and interventional neurological procedures and area of interest include advanced neuroimaging and mri technology he has more than 50 publications in journals and uh, textbooks to his credit and uh, some of the uh, awards to his credit uh, is uh, dr cs sambashiva rao memorial endowment gold medal and has delivered the k uh chaya memorial 6th annual oration he's a brilliant ra uh, radiologist and we are lucky to have him here today with us uh very warm welcome sir and over to you thank you shefali for the kind inter introduction are my slides visible yes, yes sir so at the outset i'd like to thank i focus uh, for inviting me to be, deliver this lecture Today's presentation is going to be on the basics of MRI for the ophthalmologist. Uh, in this presentation, what I would be covering is uh, the basics of MRI technology, how exactly the MRI images are produced, what are all the sequences that we use in MRI commonly, what are all the safety, patient safety issues we are worried about, and the common imaging artifacts that we see in MRI that can interfere with our uh, interpretation of images. that will be followed by a short uh, description on imaging anatomy of the orbit and the orbital structures how different structures look like mm -hmm. on the basic pulse sequences and uh, uh, how uh, the orbit looks like on axillary and coronal images primarily then i'll go through uh, some common pathologies and how mri helps us in the diagnosis of these pathologies and at the end let's hope uh, we can have a take home message starting with mr technology mr is a wonderful modality the way mr works is that the human body contains trillions and trillions of atoms all atoms have nuclei and electrons ro rotating around them and the nuclei contain neutrons and protons and these are the protons that are very interested in uh, mr imaging specifically not all protons we are interested in hydrogen protons no hydrogen atom contains a single proton right in the center of the nucleus and it has an electron surrounding it Uh, rotating around it and the hydrogen proton is a positively charged uh, particle which is rotating around its axis and thereby uh, basic physics tells us that any rotating charge makes a particle behave like a magnet so we have millions and millions rather trillions and trillions of hydrogen atoms inside us the nuclei of which <clears throat> behave like tiny bar magnets why specifically hydrogen because of two properties one hydrogen is the most abundant atom in the human body we know that most of the human body is composed of water and water has two hydrogen atoms in it similarly carbohydrates proteins and lipids which are the building blocks for virtually all tissues have a lot and lot of hydrogen atoms inside them this abundance of hydrogen atoms precisely more than 60% of the human body is made of hydrogen followed by oxygen and carbon and this hydrogen is amenable for mr imaging thereby we are interested in hydrogen for mri the second property that is very important with regards to mr imaging is that the hydrogen atoms because of their rotation around their axis the protons rotating around their axis behave like small bar magnets they can be influenced by external magnetic fields for example if you put a powerful external magnetic field with a north and south pole just like a bar magnet tries to align itself to the north and south axis protons in the human body also align themselves to the north and south axis it is this principle that we try to employ in mr imaging how do we do that this is an mr unit for those of you who have not come to an mr unit before this is a very powerful magnet that's about 30 to 60000 times as powerful as the earth's magnetic field it's got a central uh, opening a tunnel like opening which is called as the bore the bore of the magnet is where the magnetic lines of force pass through and the patient lies down in this couch and the head specifically for the orbits <clears throat> this something called as a head coil it surrounds the head and uh, this whole assembly along with the patient along with the head coil is taken to the center of this magnet where the magnetic lines of force act on the human body and make mr possible 
the way the machine uh, with the magnetic field is here and the patient's body is introduced the head is introduced into the main magnetic field subsequently we use radio frequency energy to impart energy to the protons and the protons undergo something called excitation these high energy protons when we switch off the radio frequency pulse they give out that energy in the form of signal the signal is caught by the radio frequency coil that is wrapped around the patient's head and this process is called relaxation and this signal is caught by the coil and an image is created so this is a fundamental physics of how an mr imaging uh, is uh, happening so how do we get all those wonderful images that we get in mri because this process of excitation and relaxation gives us control over how much of excitation can happen how much of relaxation can happen how much of time we can allow between before each of these processes and each of these uh, contributes to the rich contrast mechanisms that we can actually impart into the image and that gives us wonderful information regarding the patient's body that builds basis for all the pulse sequences that we get coming next to pulse sequences what are pulse sequences a pulse sequence is basically a set of instructions that are given by the computer in the mr unit to the hardware in the computer so that a particular set of uh, signal is achieved with a particular set of parameters so that a particular contrast is imparted to the signal that comes in to make it simple i'll tell you that this is a t1 weighted image for this the patient has been put into the magnet and we have used certain parameters to impart the t1 contrast into the image we run the sequence for about 2 to 1 1/2 minutes and the image the signal that comes out from the patient is constructed by the computer to form this image then subsequently we run this sequence this is a t2 weighted image about 20 slices of this contrast we run this takes around 2 to 1 1/2 minutes more and so on this way a mr study is composed of multiple individual pulse sequences the choice of which rests within the radiologist or the technician who is prescribing a particular set of sequences to best get the information out from the patient just like in ct in mr also we can give contrast <clears throat> for those of you who have some exposure to neuroophthalmology or orbital imaging would have uh, this idea as to what this is this is a fusiform enlargement of the left optic nerve inside the left uh, orbit the entire op orbital segment of the optic nerve is enlarged and it's extending into the neural for uh, optic foramen this is an optic nerve glioma this is a t2 weighted image the t2 weighted image shows that the lesion is brighter than normal white matter normally the optic nerve has the same signal intensity as white matter you know that the white matter Uh, extension from the brain is what is the optic nerve so signal intensity brighter than the optic nerve normal optic nerves tells you that the lesion is hyper intense on t2 weighted images the same lesion is iso intense on t1 weighted images it has the same signal intensity as gray matter so those of you who are accustomed to ct know that ct density values are described and you have something called hounsfield units that quantify the density values in mr we don't have anything equivalent to hounsfield units these are arbitrary values so we always use a particular internal reference to tell how the signal intensities are and for the orbits the internal reference is a cortical gray matter the cortical gray matter if something is the same signal intensity as the cortical gray matter we call it iso intense and if something is brighter than the cortical gray matter we call it hyper intense for example the vitreous and aqueous in the globe are hyper intense to the um, cortex on t2 weighted images and the same structures are hypo intense to the cortex on t1 weighted sequences similarly all structures have got individual signal intensities i'll go through that in one of the subsequent slides there is a contrast enhanced t1 weighted image just like in ct we give iodinated contrast in mr we give gadolinium contrast media and areas of increased vascularity areas where the there is a uh, increased leakiness of the capillaries the contrast medium leaks out in the surrounding tissues and it causes a bright signal intensity on t1 weighted images typically after giving contrast we acquire one more set of t1 weighted images sometimes with fat saturation as in this case and that wherever there is increased blood supply or increased leakiness of the capillaries for example in a neoplastic lesion or inflammatory or infective lesions you would expect leaky capillaries and increased blood supply they show enhancement enhancement is again described as the degree of enhancement for example the periphery of the lesion is showing intense enhancement the center of the lesion is showing moderate to mild enhancement in post contrast study so after introducing these terms let me just go through some of the areas which show normal enhancement not every enhancement is abnormal normally the globe contains the choroid 
the um, uh, retina as well as sclera, the choroid is highly vascular. And that can show as a thin line of enhancement on post-contrast study if your uh, sequences are good. The extraocular muscles are devoid of any blood uh, barriers. So thereby, they enhance intensely on post-contrast study. More than the uh, peripheral muscles, skeletal muscles, you have the extraocular muscles enhancing intensely. The lacrimal glands intensely enhance. Apart from that, the nasal mucosa enhances and the pituitary gland and the venous structures such as the cavernous sinus enhance. This is important to them because even if the radiologist has done a contrast study, even if the scan center has done a contrast study, you may not actually, uh, the contrast may not actually re reach the orbit. Sometimes when the venous axis is not good, the contrast can accumulate inside the uh, subcutaneous plane. It may not reach the orbit. And you may falsely uh, think that the lesion is a non-enhancing lesion because the contrast is not yet reached there. It does not enhance. So how do you differentiate it? You should always look for on a contrast enhanced study whether these structures, which are normally enhancing on post-contrast study, are enhancing or not. Only then you can be sure that the contrast is in, uh, reached the uh, area of interest. And then you can determine whether this, the lesion is enhancing or not enhancing. With both T2-weighted images and post-contrast T1-weighted images, it is important to acquire fat-saturated sequences. To show you, normal fat is very bright on T2-weighted images. This is a subcutaneous fat and this is a retroorbital fat. And when you have some structure that is bright within this, it is very difficult to dif uh, differentiate between the two structures. For example, uh, if you look carefully, the right optic nerve has an intermediate signal intensity similar to the white matter in the brain, whereas the left optic nerve has got a slightly higher signal intensity. That contrast is very well uh, picked up on the T2 fat-saturated sequence. The same patient with uh, a fat-saturated sequence acquired a couple of minutes later we see that the hyperintense signal in the optic nerve is very well seen on the post-contrast study, uh, on the fat-saturated sequence. Similarly, the enhancement of the left optic nerve in this case of optic neuritis is not well seen on the post-contrast uh, T1-weighted images without fat set. But when you suppress the fat signal, you can see that the optic nerve is lighting up. So you should insist on having fat-saturated sequences both for T2-weighted images as well as for post-contrast T1-weighted images to get a good imaging picture of what is happening. Lastly, not just uh, the contrast media and the contrast mechanisms, you should also look at what is the slice thickness employed and what is the resolution. Just for this, uh, to show this, uh, uh, demonstrate this concept, I've taken two axial images of the same patient. This is a patient with a retinoblastoma with a retinal detachment. Axial images taken with a two millimeter thick slices and taken with five millimeter thick slices over here. Here nicely you can see because of the good resolution, you're able to see the mass lesion, the detached retina, the subhyoid fluid over here, the small mass over here. You can even pick up the iris over here and the margin of the lens and the optic nerve sheath and all. You hardly see these structures on the thick sections. The take home, the point from this is an orbit MRI is an orbit MRI. You can't expect to get information regarding the orbit when you go for an MRI of the brain. And sections, though they include the orbit, you should not look for uh, trying to diagnose conditions of the orbit when you through uh, going for an MRI of the brain. Beyond the T1 and T2 weighted sequences, you should always look at uh, beyond the orbit. You should not forget that uh, there is a brain behind the orbit and the rest of the neural axis can be involved by the same pathology. For example, this is a patient who thought to be was thought to have an isolated optic neuritis in the left nerve, left optic nerve here. You see the bright signal intensity on this fat saturated T2 weighted images. Also, when we do the orbit sequences, a little bit of brain is included. We saw this small plaque over here. And as is a protocol, whenever we have a suspected optic neuritis, we always screen the rest of the brain and we always screen the spinal cord. And we pick up when you pick up these multiple lesions in the characteristics, juxtacorticular regions, the periventricular regions, and short segment lesions in the spinal cord, we know this is a case of multiple sclerosis. Obviously, the patient management differs when you extend the study to include a little bit of the brain too. Beyond structural imaging, MR has a, it's like a very versatile uh, tool, just like a Swiss Army knife. We have a lot of sequences that can be used and um, we can use um, certain sequences such as Fiesta or CIS or BFFE to look at the cranial nerves. We can do MR angiography or MR venography. For example, this is a BFFE sequence that shows the sixth nerve. These are extremely high resolution sequences that are optimized to show the uh, nerve structures as linear structures surrounded by CSF, which is very, very bright. So any pathology in the cranial nerves can be very well seen with this sequence. MR angiography and MR venography can be done just by altering the parameters a little bit. 
in contrast to ct where you have to give contrast medium to look at the blood vessels on mri contrast is not required to look at blood vessels of course you can do a contrast tensed mr angiogram and mr venogram also but typically about 95% of mr angiograms and mr venograms done in today's practice don't use the involve uh, don't involve the use of contrast medium so just by altering the parameters we are able to get the beautiful images of the intracranial arteries and the leakage of the blood from the cavernous sinus into the superior ophthalmic vein this is a basal view of the circle of villus the middle cerebral arteries the anterior cerebral arteries the internal cerebral arteries the expected location of the cavernous sinus is here and the flow in the superior ophthalmic vein is very well picked up over here or in this case of mr venography where the sagittal sinus is seen the transverse sinus is seen the sigmoid sinus is seen you have a focal narrowing at the junction of the transverse and sigmoid sinus on either side these are the typical imaging features of idiopathic intracranial hypertension beyond these we have diffusion weighted imaging that is sensitive for any ischemic lesions and infective lesions involving the brain and optic nerves there is a case of ischemic optic neuropathy where you have long segment hyperintensities diffusion restriction involving the optic nerve orbital segments we have perfusion imaging that tells us regarding the blood supply rather than blood flow that is picked up on mr angiography and mr venography we can look at tissue blood supply as in this case of a cavernous sinus meningioma there is a, a color image that shows the orbits over here the cavernous sinus meningioma was located here and that showed an increased increased blood supply this can give more information regarding the uh, vascularity of the tissue and thereby help with the differential diagnosis gre sequences or sw sequences are very sensitive to pick up calcification and hemorrhage primarily used in the brain very occasionally used in the orbits in addition to the orbit and brain we have certain specialized sequences such as dynamic mri for example this is a series of post contrast images acquired one image every 10 seconds after giving contrast we can see that there's a gradual enhancement of the extraocular muscles on the left side the superior ophthalmic vein is showing intense enhancement on the right side you see that there's a filling defect within the superior ophthalmic vein subtle abnormalities like superior ophthalmic vein thrombosis need certain techniques such as this dynamic mr technique so we tend to use the techniques that we have, that we have at our disposal and uh, try to get that information that is required to make a diagnosis further information primarily with regards to intracranial lesions mr spectroscopy can tell us regarding the chemical composition of a tissue diffusion tensor imaging can tell us regarding the microarchitecture and bold functional mri can tell us regarding the cortical activation with regards to the brain parenchyma in relation to certain stimuli that we can give to the patient downside of all this we have a lot of tools but using each of these pulse sequences the more the number of pulse sequences the more number of imaging planes that we acquire the higher the image resolution that we require more the scan time for example on the left over here we have an example exam card that is used for our case of retinoblastoma we start off taking a survey that is something like a scanogram a basic low resolution sequence that is used for planning subsequently we take an axial image for the brain and then we take t2 axials and t1 axials for the orbits and we use quasi coronals quasi sagittals for the left and right orbit for example and then we give contrast and then we acquire all these sequences to get full information regarding retinoblastoma but if you notice on the top left corner 39 minutes 39 minutes is a scan time that i need to use on my 3 tesla mr on a 1.5 tesla mr it could be even more if you want the same resolution that i get so we need to draw a line somewhere because money uh, time is money scanning time is money and not only just money with regards to scanner time there is a component of fatigue also that sets in into the patient even the most cooperative patient if you make him lie down in the scanner for 40 minutes and ask him not to move his eyes he is going to become uncooperative so we need to fine tune if you give us information regarding what exactly is the pathology i'm coming to the point that it, there needs to be a good communication between the ophthalmologist and the radiologist where the ophthalmologist passes on the information saying that these are the information this is my differential diagnosis and this is the information that i require so that in a minimum scan time the radiologist can run the sequences that are necessary and give the information that is required what are the challenges in mri in ophthalmology there are small structures that require extremely high resolution if the information regarding the area that is of interest is not there it involves a large area of coverage it's a very heterogeneous environment you have the orbits that are surrounded by the paranasal sinuses the bone the air all these actually disturb the magnetic field over here and thereby certain sequences don't work well and obviously long scan times are the biggest problem with mri ct is much faster mr is very very slow other challenges one ophthalmologists are not familiar 
very well with uh, the MR as a modality, what it can do and what it cannot do. Similarly, radiologists on the other hand also are not very well trained with regards to handling orbit imaging. There's a lack of standardized protocols. Uh, there's a lot of literature regarding how should you should do a brain MRA for multiple sclerosis. But for an optic neuritis, what are the basic sequences? There's very uh, minimal literature. So standardized protocols aren't there. And the problem uh, as lack of communication, this is the point I was trying to make. A good amount of communication between the uh, ophthalmologist and the radiologist will help uh, uh, reduce the effect of all these things. Coming next to a few MR artifacts that can interfere with our imaging. Common artifacts that we see are motion artifacts. When the patient moves his eyes, you see this sort of blurring and the outlines of the images are not very well seen. And you have a fuzzy margins and subtle hyperintensities. And these are the pattern that you see with motion artifacts. There's no ED solution. We ask the patient to close their eyes. We ask the patient to uh, fixate on certain objects, but uh, sometimes nothing helps. These are something called susceptibility artifacts. This is a normal fat saturated sequence that shows the optic nerve and complete suppression of the retroorbital fat. It should be black. This is a patient who has dental implants, metallic screws that have placed the dental implants in place. The metal from here disturbs the magnetic field and the effect of this extends to a variable extent onto the orbit, sometimes onto the brain also, and fat suppression does not work well. So you have orbit where the retroorbital fat is bright. So here I'm not sure whether it is edema or the retroorbital fat, or an incomplete suppression of fat because of the susceptibility artifacts. So there are no easy solutions to this. We do have certain techniques, but they don't work always. The third thing is partial voluming artifacts. When you have uh, thin structures like the optic nerves, we need thin slices to image them. When you use slightly thicker slices, what happens is, for example, the optic nerve is never straight. It is kinked. And when my slice passes through this, I have the entire optic nerve sampled in this rich location, but I have a part of fat and a part of the optic nerve sampled in this location. This manifests itself as some amount of fat signal overlapped on the optic nerve over here that is bright on T2 weighted sequences and dark on the T2 fat sat sequences because the surrounding fat has already been suppressed over here. So these should be recognized as normal uh, artifacts and uh, they should not be mistaken for pathology. After artifacts, to complete the technology part, a few safety issues. If you look at your pockets today, you'll see one of these structures, I'm sure. So we are actually amazed at the number of things people carry in their pockets without realizing uh, that they have metals inside the body. So all patients undergo a thorough check. Any of these objects, when they're uh, uh, brought into the powerful MR environment, they can act as a projectile. They can actually harm the patient if there's a sharp ob object like a scissors or anything of that sort or they can even damage the equipment. We are also more concerned about objects that are inside the patient's body. For example, implants, dental braces, uh, uh, dental implants, heart valves, and uh, cardiac stents. These are implanted firmly inside the patient's body, and most often, these are not contraindications for MRI. Things that can be taken off, for example, mascara and uh, artificial eyelashes, they cause a lot of artifacts in orbital imaging, and they should be removed before the MRI. Things that, are, uh, that contain electronic components, for example, pacemakers or deep brain stimulation or cochlear implants or hearing aids, these have to be removed before taking the patient to the MR atmosphere or they can be, get permanently damaged. And patients who have been operated and have metallic implants in the human body, they uh, are MR is best avoided in them for a few months at least till the metallic implant becomes impregnated into the human body and cannot move. And with regards to MR in ophthalmology, the most important absolute contraindication for MRI in ophthalmology is, of course, the metallic intraocular foreign body. If the fair, same foreign body had been inside this muzzle over here, I would not bothered much. I would have gone for an MRI because the muzzle supports the foreign body. Whereas in the globe, the foreign body is free to move around. It is free to cause damage to the ocular structures in the MR environment when it moves. So thereby, we don't take these patients up. Any patient with a suspicion of an injury with a metallic fragment inside are candidates for CT and never for an MRI. So after the technology in MRI, let's go to imaging anatomy. Let's look at how individual structures look like on MRI. Air does not have much of hydrogen, so it is dark on MRI imaging. The paranasal sinuses are dark on MRI imaging, except where there is mucosa. Similarly, cortical bone contains very little water the dense cortical bone is hypointense on all sequences. 
if you look at the lens in the globe, the lens is hypo intense on because of its crystalline structure, it is iso intense on T1 and hypo intense on T2 weight images. Cerebrospinal fluid is dark on T1, bright on T2. In a similar fashion, both aqueous and vitreous have the same signal intensity as cerebrospinal fluid on T1 and T2 weighted images. As we said before, the white matter of the uh, brain is similar in signal intensity to the optic nerve. If the optic nerve is abnormal or normal, you want to see, you should always compare the signal intensities with the white matter over here. You have the perioptic CSF and the optic nerve sheath. The optic perioptic CSF is dark, just like the aqueous and vitreous and bright on T2-weighted images, and the optic nerve sheath is seen as a thin line. Extraocular muscles are intermediate in signal intensity on plain T1-weighted images and T2-weighted images. Retroorbital fat is bright on both T1 and T2-weighted images. In contrast, when you look at pathology, T1-weighted sequence is not very good. The plain T1-weighted sequence are not very good for looking at pathology. This is a patient with a carotid canis fistula. How do I say CCF? Because of a dilated superophthalmic vein. And secondary changes in the extraocular muscles, the extraocular muscles are larger. But the signal intensities in the extraocular muscles, these are the normal signal intensities in the extraocular muscles on the right side. Whereas on the abnormal side, you see that the muscles are bulkier, they are brighter on T2-weighted images. You vaguely can appear, you can see the heterogeneity inside the fat over here. If you do a fat-saturated sequence, you can see not only the extraocular muscles being bright, you can also pick up the fluid in the extraconal fat. You can also pick up the fat stranding inside the orbit, all these are indicative of edema involving the retroorbital fat and red, uh, orbital structures. Post-contrast study, normal uh, choroid shows enhancement, rest of the coats of the globe does not show enhancement. The ciliary body can show enhancement if your resolution is good. The normal optic nerve does not show enhancement, whereas the pathological optic nerve shows enhancement. Other normal structures that show enhancement are the extraocular muscles, the nasal mucosa, the infundibulum of the pituitary gland, the choroid plexus, as well as the pituitary gland, as well as your uh, cavernous sinuses. The lacrimal glands also show intense enhancement in post-contrast study. Let's briefly run through anatomy. These are axial slices. The bread and butter of all MR imaging is axial and coronal images. On axial images, these are the bottom of the orbits where we can see the inferior oblique muscles and a part of the inferior rectus muscles. This through the center of the orbit where we can see the optic nerve, the medial and lateral rectus muscles, the tendinous insertions of the muscles on the globe, the part of the lacrimal gland here, the globe itself, the uh, lens, the suspensory ligaments, the ciliary bodies, and uh, the iris over here, and then the sclera. You can see a thin rim over here that represents both the choroid as well as retina. Most often it is not seen, but if your resolution is good, you can pick up. You can see the retroorbital fat in the intraconal plane and the extraconal plane. You can see the sphenoid wing and the muscles outside. Slightly higher sections, you can see the same structures over here, but you, here you can see the optic nerves passing through the bony structures. Again, bone does not show signal intensity. This is the anteric uh, clinoid process. These are T2-weighted images. The anteric clinoid process being a bony structure does not show uh, any signal. And you can see the optic nerve passing between the sphenoid sinus and the anteric clinoid process through the optic canal. And subsequently, you can see the intracranial segment of the optic nerve. In this section, you can also see the superior ophthalmic veins in the top of the orbit. Subsequent section, again, superior ophthalmic veins and the top of the globe. In this section, you can see the trochlea and uh, the tendons of uh, the superior oblique muscles. And the top section shows you the trochlea very well, as well as superior rectus levator palpebrae complex. On coronal images, same structures. From anterior to posterior, you have the lens at the globe. You have the medial and lateral canthal ligaments. The insertions of the extraocular muscles in the next slide, and then you have the inferior oblique muscle. You also have the nasolacrimal duct somewhere over here. This is the area here. Subsequently, you have the middle of the globe with the extraocular muscles. Behind the globe, you have the extraocular muscles, the five muscles you can see over here the superior rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus, lateral rectus, and the medial, uh, superior oblique muscle, superior medially. Slightly posteriorly, you have the orbit lepex where the muscles are crowded all around the optic nerve. And this is at the level of the superior orbital fissure, where you have the superior orbital fissure here and the optic foramen over here, optic canal over here, where the optic nerve is here. And you can see the superior orbital fissure structures with the fat over here. And this is the anterior part of the cavernous sinus. You have the cavernous segment of the internal carotid artery. And above that, you have the, internal, uh, you have the uh, optic nerves. Slightly more posterior, intracranial segments of the optic nerves here. Flow voids of the internal carotid arteries. Flowing blood is seen as a flow void. That is, you don't see signal intensity out here because the blood moves too fast 
for MR to pick it up. You have the cavernous sinus over here, and these small rounded structures that you see are the third nerve, the fourth nerve, the uh, V1 and V2 divisions of the trigeminal nerve. The same things are seen over here. And here you have the pituitary gland inside the cella, the optic chiasm above it. Slightly posteriorly, this is the beginning of the optic tracts, and even more posteriorly, you have the optic tracts over here. And behind the cavernous sinuses, you have the Meckel's cave over here with the trigeminal nerve rootlets inside. Beyond the true axial and coronal planes, we have several other planes that are important for certain sections. For example, in true coronals, we see that the lateral rectus muscle is bulky. The medial rectus muscle is nicely seen. Why is that? Because the medial rectus muscle is cut in an anteroposti axis. The lateral rectus muscle is cut in an oblique axis. Thereby, you have an apparent thickening and ill definition of margins of the lateral rectus muscle. Whereas if you acquire quasi-coronals, that is coronals that are perpendicular to the long axis of the orbit, you see both these muscles very well defined and you get the true picture of the caliber of the muscles. So this is what we should use when we look at extraocular muscles. Similarly, quasi-sagittals are acquired along the true axis of the orbit. You can, uh, for uh, visualizing the optic nerve and for visualizing the extraocular muscle, the superior and inferior rectus muscles, this is the plane to go for. For the intracranial segments of the optic nerves, optic chasm and optic tracts, because they are oriented at a different plane, we need a different plane to acquire the images of the, uh, these seg segments in axial plane. And these, all these have to be acquired when the patient is on table. We can't acquire this data and reconstruct it in different planes later. So specifically, if your pathology is in the superior oblique muscle, we need to acquire it in a different plane where we can see the superior oblique muscle in its entirety, the tendon as well as its insertion at the trochlea, uh, the trochlea over here and its insertion onto the globe. So after the imaging anatomy, let's look for pathology. Obviously, it's not possible to look at all pathology. So what I'll be going through is some representative cases that are commonly seen that illustrate the role of MRI, the constructive role that MRI can play in uh, illustrating these uh, pathologies involving neuro-oncology, uh, I mean, ocular oncology involving uh, the oculoplasty as well as neuro-ophthalmology. A few cases. Globe, two things that ophthalmologists should be uh, aware of. A globe that is completely useless, a thysis bulbi, a shrunken globe uh, that is uh, hypointense on T2-weighted images because of dense calcification inside. On MR, we can't see calcification by itself. With susceptible T-weighted imaging, sometimes we do see calcification. But if you want to see calcification, if you want to see bone, CT is a better modality. MR is not the modality to look at calcification. But disorganization of the globe with this characteristic T2 hypointensities and optic atrophy can tell us that this is a dysfunctional eye. This is a thysis bulb eye. On the other hand, all ophthalmologists should be aware of this condition. This is uh, the indicator for an orbital compartment syndrome. This is a patient with orbital cellulitis where you have extensive edema involving the retroorbital fat as well as extraocular muscles. Because of that, there's proptosis. You know that the orbit is a closed space that is open anteriorly. And because of that, there is a gross proptosis with stretching of the optic nerve and a tenting of the globe that is defined as an angle at the posterior aspect of the globe that is less than 130 degrees. This is an emergency and has to be treated immediately. For globe pathology, MR is the modality of choice. Obviously, you can see globe pathology on fundoscopy too. But there are certain areas which are blind spots. For example, when the media is not clear, Imaging will show you a much better depiction of the uh, lesion than uh, what you can see from fundoscopy. Obviously, ultrasound is one modality that you have. Uh, MR can tell us uh, much more than what we can see uh, on all these structures. For example, this is a patient with a retinoblastoma, a mass lesion involved in the detached retina over here. It is isointense to hypointense on T2 because of calcifications. It is isointense on T1 with small calcifications over here. And then the mass lesion is enhancing on post-contrast study. What CT doesn't tell us is that this is a normal choroid that is enhancing inside the left globe. You have the normal choroid enhancing in all the right globe up to here. And beyond this, the choroid is not seen. So there is choroidal invasion in this case. So this sort of information can be brought out only by MRI. Also, when you have optic nerve invasion, this is an patient with a Focal optic nerve invasion, retrolaminar segment of the optic nerve for about 2 to 3 millimeters is involved in this patient. And this is a patient with a more extensive optic nerve invasion extending all the way up to the intracranial compartment. Also, a retroorbital uh, extension into the retroorbital fat is also there. Uh, all this information can be nicely depicted with MR imaging. 
beyond retinoblastomas, other globe tumors, just to give a simple example, a choroidal melanoma, we can make a positive diagnosis on choroidal melanoma because melanin has got a typical signal intensity. On T2, it is very dark. On T1, it is bright. And it shows intense enhancement on post-contrast study. This is a patient with a choroidal melanoma. Other differential diagnosis for this metastasis and all, sometimes it becomes slightly difficult. But when you have a typical hypointense signal over here, we know that it's either a hemorrhagic lesion or a uh, melanotic lesion. And this can help us in uh, coming to a clear differential diagnosis. Optic pathway pathology. Imaging, very commonly, uh, one common indication for imaging is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. A suspected patient with a papilledema, uh, raised ICP features clinically, when you go for imaging, we do see the cardinal signs. Previously, it was thought that imaging is negative in case of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And uh, the, the indication for imaging is to rule out intracranial masses. It is not so nowadays. We do pick up signs of raised ICP. We can nicely pick up the sort of papilledema that you pick up. Protrusion of the optic papillae can be seen on MRI. The tortuosity of the optic nerves can be seen. Increase in perioptic fluid can be seen both on coronal as well as axial images. The flattening of the posterior sclera can be seen. And the cause, almost all cases of idiopathic intracranial hypertension or raised ICP, we go for an MRI because cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is a silent uh, pathology, a very eminently treatable pathology that can uh, be missed out very easily. So all cases we go for, an, uh, IA, uh, for uh, uh, raised ICP, we go for uh, MR venogram. And the typical narrowing at the transverse sigmoid junctions, this is a typical finding that you see with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Trauma. Because fractures are best seen on CT, bone is best seen on CT. CT is the imaging modality of choice for uh, trauma. But MR sometimes picks up more pathology than CT. The advantage of MR is that it is very sensitive directly to the optic nerve signal intensities. So you may not ha actually have a bony injury. This is a case of traumatic rupture, uh, uh, avulsion of the optic nerve from the globe. This is a patient with compression of the op canalicular segment of the optic nerve by a bony fragment. You can see the altered signal intensities over here. And this is a patient in whom the MR, I mean, CT was absolutely normal, but this, the optic nerve intracranial segment showed a, a focal area of restricted diffusion indicating excited toxic injury. That is an indicator of a poor prognosis in traumatic optic neuropathy. So this sort of prognostic information can be given with MRI, even if CT is normal. Optic nerve ischemia, MR is a modality of choice. The way in which it is diagnosed is to go for diffusion-weighted imaging. It is a non-specific hyperintensity on routine T1 and T2-weighted images. It does not show contrast enhancement, but diffusion restriction picks it up. We always supplement it with MR angiography. And this is an interesting case where we've done something called vessel wall imaging. We've picked up arterial wall enhancement along the internal carotid artery and enhancement to the wall of the ophthalmic artery. You require some extremely high-resolution sections to do that. This is a patient who turned out to be giant cell arteritis. The arteritis is the inflammation of the wall is what we are picking up over here. And the ischemia is because of giant cell arteritis. Optic neuritis, inflammatory optic neuropathy, MR is a modality of choice. This is isolated optic neuritis showing um, hyperintensity involving the retroorbital segment of the optic nerve. Um, enhancement on post-contrast study on plane and post-contrast study uh, on, on uh, uh, axial and coronal images with a little bit of fat stranding. Atypical optic neuritis, we can go beyond that. We can pick up multiple sclerosis by the presence of the short segment uh, uh, lesion inside the optic nerve. Apart from that, the characteristic intracranial lesions that I showed you in one of the previous slides, the spinal cord lesions, they can give us a diagnosis of MS. Antimog antibody disease is characterized by long segment, orbital segment uh, involvement in both optic nerves with characteristic perineural enhancement along the optic nerves. Whereas neuromyelitis optica typically involves the posterior orbital segments, the intracranial segments and the optic chasm and the proximal optic tracts and enhancement of these areas as well as other lesions involved in the brain and spinal cord can give us the clue regarding the true entity. Beyond inflammatory conditions, neoplasia, there's a characteristic case of optic nerve glioma, a fusiform enlargement of the optic nerves extending all the way up to the optic chasm and then you have dilatation of the perioptic nerve sheath. Just to show you a few examples where MR imaging, this sort of information regarding involvement of the optic chiasm and beyond and extension into the brain parenchyma cannot be given on CT. This is a patient with the optic nerve sheath meningioma. Typically, you have what is called as a tram track sign. You have enhancement along the walls of the optic nerve with the optic nerve itself not showing enhancement, but the lesion involved in the optic nerve sheath shows a tram track sort of enhancement on axial images or a donut sort of enhancement 
on post contrast coronal images going beyond the optic nerve optic chiasm compressive pathology mr imaging is a modality of choice all the information that is required by the surgeon to operate on this patient is given by mr the location the extent the involvement of the cavernous sinus the displacement of the surrounding structures the location of the optic nerves in relation to the lesion the optic chiasm retro bulbar uh, i mean retro uh, uh, cellular extension all this is best made out on uh, mr imaging this is a case of pituitary macroadenoma this is a case of tuberculum men cell meningioma differentiation on, between the two on ct is not possible on mr if you are lucky you can see the lesion and the pituitary gland separately the signal intensities of the tumor and the pituitary gland are different the enhanced pattern pattern of the tumor and the pituitary gland are different so you can make a diagnosis of a tuberculum cell meningioma that is causing compression of optic nerve uh, optic chiasm as well as compression on the pituitary gland this sort of information is important because the neurosurgeon would plan his treatment based on the diagnosis this is a classic case of craniopharyngioma the typical imaging feature is that the pituitary gland is normal in the cella and supracellular system you have a heterogeneous lesion that is hyper intense on t2 weighted images almost cystic with some solid components the solid components show enhancement in post contrast study and the cystic components are more heterogeneous they don't have the same signal intensity as csf this is a typical imaging feature of craniopharyngioma beyond that ocular motility disorders just running through you have a patient with an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia just because the ophthalmologist gave us that the clinical diagnosis is ino we could do this dedicated high resolution sequence this takes around 4 4 and a half minutes this takes around 5 minutes to scan we routinely don't run these sequences only when you do this high resolution sequences you can pick up these small lesions and confirm the pathology so that sort of information regarding your localization is very important for us so that we can find you the protocol and in the given time we can get that information that is essential to make the diagnosis third nerve palsy again intracranial aneurysms we can always supplement a routine imaging sequences this is a third nerve compression because of a uh, aneurysm post communicating aneurysm this is the left third nerve the right third nerve is compressed by the aneurysm mr angiography as well as the source uh, images of the mr angio show the aneurysm that is confirmed on him, uh, on the dsa third nerve inflammatory pathology this is enhancement of the third nerve it is normal in caliber enhancing on th on post contrast study and you can see the signal intensity of the uh, extraocular muscles supplied by the third nerves that uh, represent the denervation changes in Infl other inflammatory conditions tolazahin syndrome the classic soft tissue lesion in the anterior orbit uh, anterior part of the cavernous sinus extending into the orbital apex with edema of the extraorbital fat and enhancement on post contrast study it's easy to make a diagnosis of cavernous sinus from uh, cavernous uh, I mean tolazahin syndrome this is a case of meiosis sarcosis other common condition for uh, external ophthalmoplegia in india you have a cystic lesion inside the orbit all of us know the presence of the scolex is best seen with thin sections like the bfi sequence running through orbital pathology this is a case of thyroid eye disease the fusiform enlargement of the extraocular muscles with sparing of the tendons and uh, relative sparing of the extra uh, retroorbital fat is what is seen on mr what is not seen on ct is the extent of inflammation the extent of enhancement and the compression of the optic nerve involvement of retroorbital fat that's all much better picked up on mr rather than on ct in contrast non specific orbital inflammatory disease involves the extraocular muscles the retroorbital fat involves the tendons of the extraocular muscles it can involve the uh, extend into other structures such as the uh, the lacrimal gland as well as the periorbital soft tissues and so on and sometimes a differentiation from orbital abscess is difficult on ct diffusion restriction on mr can tell us that it's an infective process and orbital masses such as venal lymphatic malformations can be very well depicted the whole extent not only in the orbit but outside the orbit also can be very well depicted on mr imaging and we all know about the carotid venous fistula that's seen as flow voids involving the cavernous sinus as well as superior orbit uh, of of thalmic uh, super uh, of thalmic vein and uh, completed on mr venography so after that i'll just run through a short um, take home messages mr imaging though uh, most of ophthalmologists are hesitant to use mr imaging as a imaging modality it's a comprehensive imaging modality that can give a lot of information uh, regarding the orbit much beyond what you can hope to get with ct though ct has some very strong points especially with regards to bony anatomy as well as fractures and things like that and an acute trauma and cooperative patient ct is a modality of choice initially but mr should be used as a modality of uh, modality for a lot of entities it can give a wealth of multiparametric data for example perfusion 
MR angiography and uh, so on. We can add sequences based on the requirements. It's a grossly underutilized imaging technique by ophthalmologists. Uh, but the good thing is that uh, with availability of more equipment and uh, the current generation of ophthalmologists are uh, open to using MR. From our side, we are always working on optimizing the image protocols. And uh, we should always realize that it's a team work. If you tell us what is required, we as radiologists will try to optimize our imaging protocol so that we get what information is required for you to treat the patient in the within the constraints uh, that are imposed by our uh, scanner uh, uh, timings and other uh, uh, limitations that we have. So I would uh, recommend that uh, all of you should uh, team up with your radiologists, talk to them and tell them you should coach them regarding uh, what indications require what sort of information. That's how I've learned. Uh, and for that, I should thank the team at LV Prasad Eye Institute as well as uh, Center for Sight for giving me all the follow-ups and uh, being such wonderful teachers all through. And uh, with that, I think I should uh, conclude this session. Thank you so thank very you. much, sir, for uh, such a wonderful lecture. It's a pleasure always hearing you both on the phone and now live on iFocus platform. Uh, so we have a few questions. Can we take them right away? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the first question one of the viewers has asked is how do you differentiate between a fungal granuloma and a non-specific orbital inflammation on MRI imaging? Right. So uh, we had this problem quite a bit uh, during the COVID pandemic. So um, fungal granuloma is a um, mo almost always you see involvement of the paranasal sinuses and spread from the paranasal sinuses is the first thing that you look out for. So uh, you look at the paranasal sinuses. Uh, most of us have some amount of mucosal thickening in our uh, paranasal sinuses, but the typical signs, hypointensity on T2 weighted images because of this fungus generally accumulates amount of uh, heavy metals. Uh, the fungal uh, lesions are hypointense on T2 weighted images, and because they are angioinvasive, they uh, they don't enhance much on post contrast study. It's also called as a black turbinate sign on imaging literature. So involvement of the paranasal sinuses. Uh, is one uh, important sign. Second is destruction of the walls. Generally, uh, when you have an spread from the paranasal sinus into the orbit, you have destruction of the walls of the paranasal sinus, which is very important uh, to look out for. On MR, it may be difficult sometimes, but uh, you do sometimes pick up that the periosteum is elevated, the orbital, uh, 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 I mean, uh, the periorbita is uh, uh, I mean, elevated. Sometimes there is a focal defect in the periorbita. And uh, contiguous areas of involvement in the orbit uh, should uh, suggest the possibility of a um, fungal involvement. Uh, sometimes it becomes very difficult. Uh, we all made mistakes. Uh, but then with careful attention, once we had this COVID pandemic and we started seeing this uh, fungal sinusitis uh, at a, with a larger numbers, we've optimized the protocol. We've set up something called as a COVID protocol in our hospital. So uh, with that... Uh, I think, uh, to my knowledge, uh, um, we made a mistake twice in about um, 400 odd cases, if I remember right. All right. So, may I request you to unshare your screen, sir, you, so that we can have a full view of uh, the video? Yes. Thank you, sir. The second question is How does an inflammatory lesion appear on T1 and T2 based imaging? So inflammation, depending on what structure it is inv involved, uh, what structure is involved, the signal intensities would vary, the pattern would vary. Any inflammation has a swelling. When, when there's active inflammation, there is accumulation of water, so the object is swollen. For example, optic neuritis, you have a mild swelling in the optic nerve. Extraocular muscles, when they're inflamed, you have an increase in bulk of the extraocular muscles. Retroorbital fat normally has fat lobules and some connective tissue septae in between. So the fat lobules don't uh, accumulate water, but the connective tissue septae accumulate water. So what you see is on T1-weighted images is basically thickening of this connective tissue septae. Saying that, signal intensity changes are very poorly seen on uh, T1-weighted images. On T2-weighted images, especially fat-saturated T2-weighted images, you can very easily pick up the signal intensity changes. The increased water content is very nicely picked up on T2-weighted images. On post-contrast study, inflammation is associated with an increase in capillary leakiness. So thereby, most of these conditions enhance on post-contrast study. So those are the cardinal signs. And depending on the, or, uh, the particular pathology that is causing inflammation, the structures and what pattern of structures are being involved would vary. 
All right, sir. So uh, I had a question, sir. In a case of a thyroid eye disease, apart from uh, involvement of the belly and sparing of the tendon, when we comment upon fat stranding and all that, so how do we make it out on an MRI? Right. As usual, the fat saturated T2 weighted sequences are uh, the uh, other things to look out for. On a normal fat saturated T2 weighted sequence, you don't see the uh, interlobular fat, uh, the septae inside the uh, retroorbital fat. Whereas uh, edema of these septae causes that bright signal intensity, linear strands of hyperintensity in the retroorbital fat. That's what is exactly fat stranding. All right, sir. So the next question is, how do we differentiate between various etiologies causing an increased thickness of the extraocular muscles? Basically, continuation of this question, sir, like differentiating a thyroid eye disease versus myositis versus a keratocavernous fistula leading to or uh, cysticercosis uh, causing all muscle thickness. Yeah. So, as I said, uh, when you have inflammation, uh, it is the question of where exactly it is inflamed, what are the other structures that are involved. In thyroid eye disease, typically you have a fusiform enlargement where the bellies are enlarged, the tendons are spared. Whereas in um, uh, myositis, uh, you have involvement not only of the uh, belly, but also extending onto the tendon. In addition, you have involvement of other structures in the, uh, for example, a lot of fat stranding in the retroorbital fat, involvement of the lacrimal glands, involvement of the periorbita all around, the soft tissues surrounding the orbit. Involvement is more common with, um, thyro uh, with uh, um, uh, myositis rather than with the thyroid eye disease. Cystisarcosis is typically seen as edema involved in the extraocular muscles, but you can see the cyst. With current imaging techniques on a 1.4 or 3 Tesla MR, when, pre with, when performed reasonably well with, uh, say, 3 or 4 millimeter size thickness, you can see the cyst. It is seen as a hyperintense uh, lobular structure. Demonstrating that there is a mural nodule inside the scolex takes a bit of effort. It can it requires very thin sections, sublimitic slice, uh, slice thicknesses to get uh, that sort of information out. With regards to CCF, again, you have a non-specific enlargement of the extraocular muscles. They do enhance intensely. There's a lot of periorbital, uh, retroorbital fat stranding. The typical signs are basically looking for the superior ophthalmic vein dilatation, looking for the cavernous sinus, having flow voids inside the cavernous sinus. These are the things, and especially the clinical history, especially if you have trauma and so on, and uh, the epistatal congestion and things like that. Right. So how do we investigate a case of polytrauma with the unknown nature of intraocular foreign body? Right. So when there is any suspicion of a glow perforation uh, clinically, I think uh, you should avoid an MRI. So most often, somebody who's got a severe head injury um, that uh, involves a little bit of uh, uh, when there is suspicion of a uh, 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 main perforation of the globe, it generally is a severe head injury and the patient will not be very stable for an MR. He'll have more problems to worry about than the globe. For example, intracranial injuries, which can be actually um, more uh, relevant from a prognostic point of view. So the best thing anyway is to go for a CT because one, he's not stable enough for an MRA and two, the imaging modality during acute trauma for head injuries is CT. So to go for a CT first, and then if there is a suspicion and you have ruled out an intraocular for a trauma, a metallic foreign body on CT, then you can go for an MR if you still find it relevant. In which cases is a contrast-based imaging mandatory? Right. So as a protocol, uh, most conditions, uh, 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 which uh, I mean, uh, they come for a requisition, they come with a requisition, most come with uh, a requisition for a contrast. And certain times we don't go for a contrast study. Um, current contrast media are very, very safe, uh, except in patients with renal failure and with a high, uh, I mean, a low GFR, EGFR. In these individuals, there is a possibility of uh, renal damage and uh, connective tissue damage because of the contrast media, but otherwise they're generally safe. So areas where you should not give contrast or where contrast is not needed is basically your congenital pathologies. Things like carotid canis fistula, where MR angiography and all can tell you things that involve flow and all. Um, these conditions, you don't require contrast media. Whereas any inflammatory condition, any suspicion of an infective condition, any suspicion of a neoplastic condition, any suspicion of uh, a spread of pathology from the intracranial compartment, any inflammatory condition while in the um, uh, visual axis, all, virtually all these require contrast. All right, sir. So how do we differentiate between a diffuse infiltrative RB and a Coates disease on imaging? Okay. So it is difficult 
uh, only recently we had this problem uh, uh, where uh, on CT we try to differentiate it. Normally, 95% of RBs uh, show calcification. Um, about 5% of cases don't show calcification. And uh, that is where actually it becomes a problem. On imaging, it's the enhancement pattern. Typically, Coates disease shows enhancement of the retina because it's a, uh, I mean, uh, abnormal telangiectasis vessels involved in the retina. You have a retinal detachment with enhancement of the retinal vessels. Whereas in um, retinoblastoma, you have an enhancing mass lesion all around the retina. In addition, if you find some features like, uh, for example, uh, rest of the features that is seen only in retinoblastoma, for example, optic nerve invasion or nodularity or, uh, for example, um, uh, choroidal invasion, all these are features that can tilt it more in favor of uh, retinoblastoma. All right. See, how do you differentiate between a fungal granuloma versus a tubercular granuloma on MRI? Okay. Sometimes it is difficult. Again, uh, isolated fungal granulomas involving the orbit are extremely uncommon. In the brain, we do have fungal granulomas involving the brain and tubercular granulomas involving the brain. There are certain morphological criteria. For example, a tubercloma contains a, has a um, garland-like appearance. I mean, um, whereas a fungal granuloma has excrescences that actually enter into the center of the lesion. We have microhemorrhages more in commonly in case of fungal granulomas, whereas tuberculomas don't have microhemorrhages. There's subtle T1 hyperintensity in tuberculomas and so on. So those are features that are more seen in intracranial uh, tuberculomas and uh, fungal uh, lesions. Whereas uh, a tubercular involvement of the orbit is extremely, extremely uncommon. Fungal granuloma is more likely to extend from the paranasal sinuses. Uh, to be frank, I don't think I've seen a single case of a tubercular, a proven tubercular granuloma in the orbit. Okay. So uh, this is another question. Uh, is there a preferred sequence for uh, the imaging of whole of the visual pathway? Okay. So visual pathway is a very heterogeneous area. You have the optic nerves that are three millimeters in slice thickness, three millimeters in thickness, extending from the globe up to the orbital apex in one plane. And subsequently you have a tilt upwards. The optic nerves are in this plane initially. And then as they go intracranial, they, they are oriented in a different plane. So a single plane cannot show the entire length of the optic visual pathway. Leave alone the visual pathway, even the entire length of the optic nerve is, seen is, is not seen in a single plane. So we do have to acquire multiple planes um, if you want to see them in the entirety. And obviously in the brain, your pulse sequence are entirely different from what you acquire for the uh, anterior visual pathways. Yes. So how do we differentiate the different types of vascular malformations based on MRI? So um, just based on MRI and the clinical history, yes, because the age of presentations of these vascular malformations is different. An infantile hemangioma is more common in a young individual, generally with, as an infant or maybe within the first, first three years of life. There are very, very well circumcised lesions. There are small flow voids within. And generally, you do pick up a small feeder extending into that area. The intense in, uh, very enhancedly, uh, enhance very intensely with post-contrast study. And off late, uh, we've been doing perfusion imaging, though it's not described in literature. We are actually trying to do more of perfusion imaging. They brilliant, brilliantly light up, like a light bulb. They enhance on post-contrast, on uh, perfusion imaging. Whereas uh, venal lymphatic malformations are a mixed uh, lesions. The venous components enhance on post-contrast study. They're uh, hyperintense on T2. And uh, they do have small phleboliths in the spaces. The lymphatic components generally are bright on T2-weighted images. The septa enhance, but uh, the cystic components don't show enhancement. And generally, they do show some flow, uh, fluid levels. And they are infiltrative lesions. They surround the vessel, uh, vessels, they surround the extraocular muscles, they surround the optic nerve without causing much of mass effect. They pass through the inferior orbital fissure in, into the infratemporal fossa and so on. Varices, again, mimicking... Uh, um, I mean, venal lymphatic malformations, uh, they do have a similar imaging pattern. But uh, most often what you have is the signal intensity is more like a very homogeneous lesion in compared, as compared to venal lymphatic malformations. And uh, on MRI, it is difficult to do a Valsalva manure. Sometimes you make the patient lie down prone or lie to the side and uh, do an MRI. We see demonstrate the increase in size of the lesion on um, increased uh, intra-abdominal pressure. So these are the features that we try to differentiate. AV malformations are completely different. Um, I mean, the pattern does not overlap with any of these. So in a case of a, uh, in a patient presenting with a hemifacial spasm, where we want to image the brain, apart from a comparison of a rootlet or a particular nerve, 
uh, what are the other abnormalities we can look at so demyelinating lesions uh, uh, are uh, according to literature there are few entities uh, i mean few cases where demyelinating lesions involving uh, the medulla the pontomedullary junction uh, are known to cause hemifacial spasm but beyond that it's so primarily the compression on the um, facial nerve by the neuro, uh, by the loop vascular loop that's what we should look out for all right sir so in a case of a thyroid eye disease where we are taking the where we are considering the ocular uh, extraocular muscle thickness at what level of the orbit do we take the uh, scans it's important uh, because we don't have normative data for the indian population to have a consistent we always compare it to the contralateral orbit and we make sure that we do it exactly in the same location for both orbits if somebody is using a, a single coronal image uh, to visualize both orbits and measure the extraocular muscles it is not relevant but specifically when we do quasi coronals to accurately delineate the extraocular muscles uh, we need to make sure that they are taken exactly at the same level and we generally take it at the mid orbit level we take the lateral wall of the orbit from the lateral margin up to the orbital apex at the midpoint is where we take the quasi coronal image and that is the image that we use to uh, that because that coincides with the center of the belly of the muscle okay sir so in a case of a recent onset um, the tosis where we are thinking of a possible neurologic etiology what are the other points to be considered or imaging sir so one it is important for us to identify uh, localize um, where exactly we are looking at for example a brain stem uh, origin for a third nerve palsy would be different from a cisternal segment which would be different from your cavernous sinus and subaortic fissure um doing a proper study including all these structures with the relevant images would takes around 30 35 minutes okay so if you are able to say that this is a particular location we can concentrate on these areas so typically the sequences that i do if that history is there and uh, i there's no clinical localization is to go for a flare sequence for the brain to look for small demyelinating plaques do a mr angiography to look for the third nerve palsy because of uh, your uh, uh, compression by uh, uh, aneurysms i do an oblique axial um, bffe or fiesta sequence to look at the third nerve in its entire length i do coronal images predominantly for your um, cavernous sinus and orbital apex both with fat sat and without fat sat and obviously i do contrast study with the contrast i take very thin slices along the axis of the optic uh, uh, oculomotor nerve look for enhancement of the optic oculomotor nerve most often we do pick up something all these cases where uh, it was thought to be a diabetic third nerve palsy we do pick up a lot of inflammation when we do um, them are right all right so also uh, recently we did come across a case of uh, acute onset ptosis and um, uh we had uh, requested for a mri with you and then uh, we had a, a thinning of the cisternal segment of the oculomotor nerve sir can you just add a word to it so thinning is a very non specific uh, entity one you can have a congenitally hypoplastic nerve that can uh, cause the thinning of the nerve or a denervation if you have a lesion inside the brain stem and the third nerve nucleus is damaged the ipsilateral third nerve would thin out If your resolution is good you can pick up the thinning of the nerve in acquired conditions but most often you do see this in congenital pathologies all right so we have a question from dr ramesh the question is is there any proven study or role of mri in amblyopic patients or other central causes of blindness uh i am not aware uh, to be frank uh, i have not searched for it uh, i am not aware of this i need to check this out <laughs> so i i think uh, dr ramesh uh, can help you out with that sir yeah <laughs> yes uh thank you so much sir it was a wonderful session listening to you uh, as informative as always and uh, uh, before we conclude for today i have a small announcement to make the next session is on 23rd of june and the topic is essentials of ophthalmic imaging the ct scan for an ophthalmologist by dr santosh anavar sir thank you sir Thank you everybody. Thank you so much sir. Thank you.